We've been going through a Target series. And today I want to talk about Target identity. I think it's one of the most powerful things that we can grasp a hold of as we are going through this series. We've talked through a number of various things that we're targeting in order to live out the year 2022 in power and purpose before the Lord, honoring the Lord Jesus Christ, blessed by God because we're honoring the principles of God. Now, there was a movie that came out uh, a number of years ago, and I wonder how many of you know what I'm talking about when I talk about the movie that had Leonardo DiCaprio and it called Catch Me If You Can. Can I see it? And, and with that movie, I don't go watch movies. I, you know, um, I stay away from that. I honor God, but no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> just teasing. Just teasing with that. Okay. So Frank Abagnale Jr. is the one that is the real life person that, uh, that Leonardo DiCaprio was uh, playing the part of. And I want to read this to you. It gives you a little bit of a uh, summarization. Is that the word? Summation? Uh, of this story. Frank Abagnale was the world's greatest con artist. I don't know how you call a con con artist great. The movie Catch Me If You Can is based on the true life story of this man who built the government out of more than $5 million by the time he was 21. Raised in the home of a father who cheated the government and a mother who cheated on her husband, He observed the ease with which a person can lie their way through life. At age 16, when his parents divorced, he ran away and for two years led uh, the life of a life of deception, creating false documents and forging checks. He passes himself off as a, get a load of this, an airline pilot, a medical doctor, and a practicing attorney. During the t- uh, this time, he even passed a state bar exam. While posing as a doctor, Frank meets a young nurse by the name of Brenda, and he falls in love with her. And when he meets her father, who's a prestigious lawyer, uh, and her mother, he scores points with them by pretending to be a graduate from the same law school as the father. Knowing that they are dedicated Lutherans, He also claims to be a Lutheran, which is a denomination, okay? So because Frank uh, looks 10 years older than he is, Brenda's father hires him uh, to be an associate in his law firm. The FBI crashes their elaborate engagement party at the parents' mansion, but Frank uh, sees them coming and he escapes uh, up the stairs to pack his bags. Before the agents enter the home, Frank's fiance Brenda follows him into the bedroom. He wants her to escape with him. He opens his suitcase to pack for a quick getaway, and Brenda sees thousands of dollars in cash stuffed into each one of the cases that he has there. Frank levels with her, and he confesses, Brenda, I don't want to lie to you anymore. I'm not a doctor and I have never attended medical school and I'm not a lawyer or a Harvard graduate. I'm not even a Lutheran. I ran away from home a year and a half ago when I was 16 and with a straight face, Brenda asks him, Frank, Frank, you're not a Lutheran? And that's that's the story of Frank Abagnale. Now he was caught and later uh, ended up helping the government learn how people do the things that he was doing. Does anybody know what I'm talking about when I talk about a Netflix show by the way, uh, uh, by the name of, uh, it's, uh, what is it, Tinder Swindler? Anybody know what I'm talking about with that? You know, only the people on the front row <laughs> do this. The rest of you uh, don't lift your hands because of what I said about people watching movies a moment <laughs> ago. I know how this works. And it's a fascinating true life story and I won't give it all away, but enough to say that uh, Tinder being a dating app, uh, there ends up being a match that this uh, lady is sharing that she was matched with this guy. He's living a very high, um, you know, very expensive living and going on private jets. And she sees all of this wealth and who he says he is is the son of a diamond uh, dealer, very wealthy, et cetera, et cetera. 
things are not as they appear. I'll just state it that way. And he is living out a different identity than what his true identity is. The Bible speaks of true identity. Let's look at Galatians. In the second chapter, the 20th verse, Paul, the great apostle, is writing to the church of Galatia, and he says these words, I have been crucified with Christ, and I no longer live. Now, I could read through that, and we could just move on, and you may not catch it. I want you to hear it again. There's great power in Paul declaring his identity. Listen again. I have been crucified with Christ, and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I now live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. So that's a declaration of identity, and it is the true identity of every one of us as believers. If we have prayed the sinner's prayer, I can tell you it's not a magical formula to pray the sinner's prayer. You're making a confession of faith. It's what's behind that prayer that you're praying. And you're stating that you now belong to Jesus. You're no longer your own. And you now have the identity of the Lord Jesus Christ. There's a professor by the name of Howard Hendricks. And he listed what spiritual life is not. And so I want to read it to you. You'd have to pay for this course normally. He's passed away, but you'd have to pay for this course. You get it for free. Here it is. This is what spiritual life is not, according to the professor. It is not a crisis, but a continual process. It is not based on knowledge, but obedience. It is not external, but internal. Not automatic, but cultivated. The product of energy is not the product of energy, but of divine enablement. It is not a dream, but a discipline. It is not an unusual experience, but a normal experience. It is not a list of rules, but a life of relationship. It is not to be endured, but rather to be enjoyed. And it's not theoretical, but it is intensely practical. And he goes on to define spiritual life as the following. The life of Christ reproduced in the believer by the power of the Holy Spirit in obedient response to the word of God. I want to read that again. Listen to it. It's very simple, but it says a lot. It, spiritual life is the life of Christ reproduced in you and in me, in the believer. By the power of the Holy Spirit, we can't work it up, in obedient response to the word of God. Now, as we started this whole series on uh, the Target series, we talked about things like prayer, Target prayer, the power of a prayer life, as we began 2022. We talked about uh, the Bible, the Word of God, uh, having a working knowledge of the Bible, uh, being, uh, what, being able to walk out the principles of the Word of God. We talked about community, and, and not just socializing, but community as in the unity of believers, and being able to see the accomplishment of things pertaining to the kingdom of God because we are in unity. Now, let's look at Colossians 3, 9. Do not lie to each other since you have taken off your old self with its practices. Now, that's an interesting statement. Since you have taken off your old self with its practices. Have we? So it's vital that we understand that there is an old self And there is a new self, according to the Bible. The Apostle Paul is encouraging believers to act in a way becoming of their new identity in Christ. Not the old identity, not the way we used to live, but as to our new identity. In Romans 6, 14, the Bible says, For sin shall no longer be your master. Wow. Because you are not under the law, but you are under grace. Now, that's pretty important for us to know, but it isn't something that we just take lightly. Grace is not something that is a a frivolous thing. Instead, grace is what Jesus died on the cross to give us. 
that we might not have to be under the law. What does it mean? It means we're not trying to live up to a set of rules and every time we break one, it's like a yo-yo as to whether or not God loves us. And a lot of times we live that way. If we feel like we did something recently that would please God, we feel close to God. If we feel like, "Uh uh-oh, I did something, I made a decision. I I did something that wasn't right. Now I'm far from God. And people live these yo-yo lives. And I can tell you, you don't need to live that way. You can have that new identity in the Lord Jesus Christ and you can live that out. And so, again, sin is no longer our master. And, uh, and by the way, do you know that when you accept Jesus as Savior and, and, and you live for him as Lord, the Bible says that you are already called a child of light. You don't have to wait for that. That's already your identity now. And not only that... You also are a citizen of heaven, according to the scriptures. Now, not something way out there in the future that may or may not happen. Your identity is that you are a citizen of heaven now. And we're to live like it now. We're not citizens of this earth when we are in Christ. Amen? Why? Because the Holy Spirit resides in us. So in Galatians 5, let's look at this letter from the Apostle Paul to the church at Galatia. So we're going uh, back into Galatians, fifth chapter, and starting with the 16th verse. Paul says, so I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the flesh desires what is contrary to the Spirit, and the Spirit what is contrary to the flesh. They are in conflict with each other so that you are not to do whatever you want. But if you are led by the spirit, you are not under the law. So you're not going to be condemned by the law if you're led by the spirit. The acts of the flesh are obvious. Okay, well, what are they, Paul? So he goes right into it. Here's some of them. Sexual immorality, impurity and debauchery, idolatry and witchcraft, hatred, Discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions, and envy, drunkenness, orgies, and the like. I warn you, as I did before, that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is, and I've been talking about the fruit of the Spirit in the last couple of Sundays. So what what is the fruit of the Spirit? Love, joy, peace, forbearance, Kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things, there is no law. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh and its passions and desires. Since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. And I think what beautiful words those are right at the end there. Since we live by the Spirit, why don't we keep the stride of the Spirit going in our lives? That we walk with the Holy Spirit, that we live as one that, uh, in whom the Holy Spirit dwells. And so that is a powerful contrast that we see here in the Bible between living for the flesh and living for the Spirit. And the Apostle Paul would pray for these early churches that were uh, coming up as the gospel would go out, there would be churches that would be planted. And Paul would come with his travel partners and he had different ones and he would come with them and he would visit the churches and when he's not with them, he's thinking about them constantly, he's praying for them, he's sending letters to these churches, each one with a fresh uh, personality or, or a different personality, I should say. And it's almost like you have kids and you've got these kids before you brought up in the same environment in the same family, but this child's personality is absolutely opposite of this one. And boy, this one over here is nothing like the other two. And it's the same with the churches. They each have these unique personalities. They each have unique issues they're dealing with. And Paul is addressing these issues. And as he does so, he's writing letters that are used by the Holy Spirit to speak to us today, to give us advice, to guide us, to challenge us. And certainly we see that not only uh, when he's writing to the church uh, at Galatia, but also um, to the Ephesians, to the church at Ephesus. 
And in the uh, first chapter of Ephesians, starting with the 18th verse, Paul says, I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened. That's a great statement. I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he has called you, the riches of his glorious inheritance in his holy people, and his incomparably great power for us who believe. Now, tell us about this power that we have as believers. So Paul does. That power is the same as the mighty strength he exerted when he raised Christ from the dead and seated him at the right hand, uh, at his right hand in the heavenly realms. So when we look at this, what we're seeing here is that Paul calls on the church at Ephesus to be spiritually aware. And I'm calling on you to do the very same thing here as we're in the month of February in 2022. I call upon you to be spiritually aware. We've got five physical senses. And with those five physical senses, we can go through life and we can end it there and only interpret things through those five physical senses. Most people do. But we have the ability to walk in the Holy Spirit and discern that which is eternal, to discern that which is spiritual, that goes beyond how the world lives. So Paul says, don't miss out on the power of the Holy Spirit. Be spiritually aware. And that's what he's telling the church at Ephesus. The Christian life is not about performance. And I want to say that again because we need to hear it. The Christian life is not about performance in our own strength, whereby we're only as good as the last good deed we did or didn't do. The spiritual life is actually much more than that. It is about recognizing our new nature given to us by what Jesus did on the cross, that we're no longer the old self. We now live for Christ. We now have a different identity. And this is our true identity. No longer do we live in the counterfeit, but we uh, are now no longer ruled by sin. And so today, there are too many believers that are living dual lives and you don't want to be one of these Christians who lives a life that looks like you're a Christian on the outside, but on the inside, you're still the same as you used to be. And you're still living in the same way that the world lives. Let's look at the book of Exodus. Go into the Old Testament now, in the 33rd chapter, 13th and 14th verses. If you are pleased with me, teach me your ways. I want to see, say that again. Teach me your ways so that I may know you and continue to find favor with, with you. Remember that this nation is your people. And the Lord replied, my presence will go with you and I will give you rest. Now we go back to that statement again that is stated there in the very first uh, verse that we read. Teach me your ways. In other words, give me the foundation upon which I can live a life that pleases you. Give me the foundation upon which I can live a life of victory and not defeat. Give me the foundation for 2022 whereby I can live in a way that is blessed. And I believe that that is the prayer of our hearts as we consider this year. When we consider God's ways, we have a compass. It's our true north. It's what guides us. Now, I've talked about this book uh, by Kenneth Boa that I uh, read and was in my studies in my doctoral program. He outlines some of God's uh, attributes. And I want to outline some of these for you uh, and share them with you because it helps us understand the identity we have, that we are children of the living God, the one true God. God is, now these are some attributes of his person, God is self-existent. He doesn't need anything else to be existent, to exist. God is infinite. He's not finite. He's not held back. He's not, you know, in some way small. God is infinite. God is eternal. He always was. He will always be. 
God is the unchanging creator. I could go on and on, but that gives you a beginning sense of some of the ways that God's person is described in, in the scriptures. God's powers, let's look at those for a moment, include that he is omnipresent. Now that means, again, as I stated about the underground church that we were in in Kiev and we're praying for Kiev and we're praying for other hot spots in the world right now, that those believers have the presence of God with them at the very same time that we do right here this morning. Because God is omnipresent. God is omnipotent. In other words, uh, God is all-powerful. That's why when people try to say, well, I, I believe God healed in the early church, but I don't think he does today. And I believe that in the early church there were miracles, but I don't believe that today is a day of miracles. Listen, God is all-powerful. God was never at any point more powerful than he is now. God is still omnipotent and he is omniscient. He's all knowing, he knows all things. We may think we hide something from him, he knows. We can't hide anything from God. God has seen you when you've been faithful, when nobody else was watching. God is a loving God and he's omniscient, he knows all. God's attributes include that God is holy. So holiness And if you ever hear anybody say something about God that sounds like he's not holy, that's not true. God is holy. God is just. Do you know that when you read through the Old Testament, you see over and over again a call for justice, that God's prophets would thunder forth justice. We need to know that in our day, that God is on the side of justice. That's why as things are happening in the world, we don't just sit back as believers and say, oh, that doesn't really affect me. As long as it doesn't touch my household. No, that's not so. We as believers are all about the heart of God. It's part of our identity that we are are on the side of justice. Amen? Truthful. God is truthful. You will not catch God in a lie. You can know that God's word is truthful. God is love. And if you've ever had God presented to you as a God that just wants to condemn and harm you, you haven't heard about the real God. That's somebody's version of God. That's not who God is. God is a God of love. You are unconditionally loved. You need to know that you're loved. There are moments where you can go through life, you feel so lonely, you wonder if you're loved. God loves you now, right now. So I'm not perfect. God loves you. And we see that God is a God of love. And God's goodness and holiness and righteousness and all of these things are attributes of God. The relationship that we are to have with God is best described in the Bible as a shepherd and sheep or a father, a loving father with his children. So these are some of the ways to describe the relationship we have with God. It speaks to our identity. We're not alone. We're not dust in the wind like you got to hear me sing if you were here a week or two ago and I won't sing it again. Dust in the wind. I mean, that's the atheist view. You come from nowhere, you'll go to nowhere. And that's it. There'll be no justice. Ones who got away with things got away with things. We could go on and on and on. And I don't believe that. That's not a biblical view of how uh, things are according to scripture. So the key to living in one's true identity is that you trust God implicitly. You need to make a decision that you trust God fully, even when you do not understand. And I have been there many times in my life where I did not understand, but I would say, God, I trust you, and I will not stop trusting you. And for those who, at those moments of crisis, stop trusting God, it causes there to be a a blockade of an ability to go forward in God the way you need to. We only live this life once. And after that, the judgment, we don't want to uh, live this life in such a way that we're not fully immersed in the purposes of God and recognizing who we are in Christ, amen? So we must uh, fully and completely trust God. Now, there was a fall uh, in the Garden of 
uh, Eden. And it brought forth, when human, humans fell, Adam and Eve, they sinned in the Garden of Eden. Uh, at that moment, there was a, a spiritual death that entered in. Spiritual death was not there before that. God's intent was not for there to ever be spiritual death. Uh, not only spiritual death, physical death entered into the Garden of Eden. All of a sudden, our bodies, our humans' bodies began to deteriorate, wouldn't live beyond a certain amount of time. There's sickness in the world. There's disease in the world. All of this came through the fall in the Garden of Eden, according to Scripture. And it has passed on to humankind ever since. And it's called the Adamic inheritance, the inheritance that you and I have from Adam. But we can replace that inheritance with the inheritance of Jesus Christ. The Bible tells us that we can. And we can have the inheritance of Christ in our lives. No longer do we need to be dominated by sin. We don't have to live that way. We don't have to have the flesh and all of its consequences because we're just, oh, we're, you know, that's just my identity. We have a new identity in the Lord Jesus Christ. And the Bible tells us that those who live in the flesh cannot please God. We see that in Romans 8.8. 8. And those in Christ become new creations, 2 Corinthians 5.17. We are new in the Lord Jesus Christ. We ought to live like it came that we might have life and that more abundant. But there's a warfare that is going on. And that warfare is between the flesh and the spirit. So on the one side, you have how you, how, how, what your identity was before you were in Christ, the flesh. And on the other side, you have your identity after you come to Christ and you live for him as Lord, then you are in the spirit. And we are not to live like this when we're over here. So when we look at this and when we consider all of, of the things that I'm talking about um, here, that we recognize that we're really in an almost but not yet moment. And I share this from time to time because when we come into Christ, well, at that moment, do I live forever? Do I still get sick? Listen, things are in an almost but not yet. Will we have resurrected bodies? Will there be no more sorrow? Will be there, will there be no more tears? Will there be a moment in which we are no longer able to be sick, but we're in full health? Absolutely, that day is coming. And something is being worked on the inside of us. And, and we will know that, those of us that are in Christ, according to the scriptures. Kenneth Boas says these words. Listen to this. We cannot consistently behave in ways that are different from what we believe about ourselves. So we must, re, we must view ourselves as redeemed, bought with a price. Everything goes back to that cross. Everything points to the cross. It's the center of all human history. If not for what Jesus did on the cross, we live in the flesh, we die in the flesh, we're dust in the wind. But if we can embrace what was done by the Son of God on the cross for you and for me, we can be the new creation, the new hearts that are spoken of in the scriptures. And so in our lives, there are felt needs that we have. I want to review those a little bit before I close. Love and acceptance is often met in a shallow way by the world. But Jesus, as I've stated, loves us unconditionally, went to the cross for you and for me, not because we are perfect, not because we did all the good works, not because of church attendance, but because God so loved the world. And I can tell you in the midst of an idea, you know, the concept of love and acceptance, that that is a felt need that every one of us have. You may say, oh, I don't need, I don't need acceptance. I don't need love. I'm doing fine. Hey, we all need love. And we all need to know that we're, accepted and even those that are closest to us can sometimes hurt us they may not even mean to do it we can feel rejected even sometimes by those that we thought we could trust in our workplace all of that speaks to the fact that only Jesus is the one 
that we can find loves us and never stops loving, accepts us and never stops accepting us. So our answer is to be found in nothing less than our relationship with Almighty God. Second thing, a felt need that I want to touch on here is the need for significance and identity. You know, uh, and honestly, if we really look at it, we'd have to say for a, a, a number of us, it's always a sense of our identity, identity being attached to something that we accomplish. And if we're not at a place where we feel like there's a wow factor to something we're doing, we don't think we measure up. And all of that can come down when we realize our true identity is found not in what we do, but in our identity as to who we are to the Father. And that's why when we look at this, significance and identity, that idea that we want to be counted, we want our lives to matter, uh, we want a truly meaningful life uh, is something that can put us on a treadmill of performance. A constant sense of God, I'm trying, I'm trying, I'm trying until we get into a works mentality and God doesn't respond to a works mentality. It's elusive, it's the brass ring we can never grasp. The third thing is like, Unto it, competence and fulfillment, the desire to contribute that which lasts. Now, uh, I remember that uh, Lisa and I had dinner with a top diplomat and his wife, and they were looking at the time of him retiring from his dipl diplomatic position, and he was talking about what's next, and we were going back and forth with ideas and discussing all of this and praying for them. And, and he was saying, all this experience, uh, my desire would be to touch the lives of others and help the lives of others with the things that I have seen and the things that I have been able to, to do. And he's Christ-centered, and it was a right thing and a noble thing for him to be thinking that way. But I can tell you that amidst all of that, it still comes back to a point where it will seem elusive if our identity is built on what we feel we're accomplishing. Now, again, for him, the accomplishment was to touch the lives of others in the name of Jesus. It was right on. But I remember when we were in D.C., Lisa and I were there in a building, and it was the second uh, term of George W. Bush being uh, inaugurated as president. And we happened to be in the building as everybody was getting their inaugural tickets. And I said to Lisa, do you see who just walked through the door? And she said, who? And I said, that's Buzz Aldrin, second man to walk on the moon. And he was all by himself. And he's walking in and he looks lost like he's trying to find somebody who isn't there. So what do you think I do? I'll help him find the person. I'll get close to him and I'll get some moon dust on me. So I walk over there with Lisa and we start talking with him. I said, excuse me, are you uh, Buzz Aldrin? He said, yes, I am. And, and I said, I'm Bill Schuler." And we start talking and he finds out I'm a pastor. And the next thing I know, he's talking about Robert Schuler out of the Crystal Cathedral in California. And they used to watch him on television. And I told him about the days I served Dr. Schuler there and the family at, uh, at that church. And we're having a great conversation, you know, in that place. Well, then after a while, the guy shows up. He was late. And he's the one who's supposed to escort uh, Buzz Aldrin as to where he's supposed to go. How can you be late for the second man on the moon? And this guy was. Well, it's Buzz Aldrin's own testimony that when he came back from having been on the moon, a realization hit him like a ton of bricks. The rest of his life, he will never accomplish anything like what he had just done. It's all going to be downhill from here. And when he felt that, all of a sudden, he got to a very low place in life. And he shares about those things. 
No matter what we do in life, I can tell you it will never be enough. Our satisfaction will be found in the fact that we are complete in the Lord Jesus Christ. We're part of the family of Jesus. And in Romans 6, if you want to read a good chapter in the Bible on, on identity, read Romans 6. We know in the third through the tenth verses, it speaks of knowing one's identity in Christ. And in the eleventh verse, it speaks of considering this truth of our identity being Christ and recognizing it as valid. And then in the twelfth through the fourteenth verses, it speaks of embracing this truth about our identity uh, before God. To recognize it, yes, but also to embrace it and to live in it. The answer is that Christ is in us. We're new creations because of that. Our thinking changes. That's why I talked about renewing our minds. Our thinking changes. The way that we live changes because we now live as to pleasing God. We now live in accordance with the ways of God. We now live in accordance with the principles of God and no longer by the principles solely of the world. So, Lion King. I'm watching The Lion King years ago and then would watch it over and over again when our kids were growing up. And there's a moment at which Simba and is with his dad you know what I'm talking about. Don't act like you don't know. And, and all of a sudden, that relationship changes. Simba's got this natural uh, sense of he's going to be the next king. And his father, Mufasa, oh no, uh, Mufasa's the father. Scar's the uncle. We don't like Scar. <laughs> Scar kills Mufasa. Simba runs off into an unknown area. Links up with two Friends, one's a warthog and the other I can't even describe. No, I don't know what he is, but Simba and Pumbaa. No, Timon and Pumbaa. So here's Simba and he sees his reflection in the water and he looks up in the stars and he sees his father who had been killed. And his father is speaking to him and the words that the father says to him, all of a sudden I feel like my dad's talking to me. My dad died at the age of 44. I never knew him. He died when I was six months old. But I feel like, in a way, my dad's talking to me through this animated movie. And the dad looks at Simba and says, son, remember who you are. Remember. Well, causes him to embrace his real identity, not this thing of eating grub worms with his two little friends. And he goes back to take over the pride that once belonged to him that he had to leave because of what Scar did. And spoiler alert, if you haven't seen it, get on the stick. So <laughs> he goes back and everything ends up being right and Scar ends up being done away with. Well, I wonder if the Holy Spirit is speaking to you right now to say, son or daughter, remember. Remember who you are. Remember your identity. Don't just embrace the counterfeit. Don't just get into something that is less than your inheritance. Don't develop a lesser appetite for spiritual life. It's important that we not seek to achieve in legalism Legalism being defined as striving in the flesh, striving in the flesh to achieve a standard of righteousness. It's not about rules, it's about the spirit. It's not about the outward appearance, it's about the inward and what Jesus is doing in our hearts. Paul tells us that the same principle that was there when we got saved, if I can use that term, sounds so religious, but when we got saved, when we, had, when we became a new creation, the very same principle that was at work is at work in sanctification. Sanctification meaning set apart to be holy. So it's by grace that we have this process of sanctification and it is a process. 
Remember, work out your salvation. We talked about that last Sunday, I believe. It was, it's like, what do you mean work out? I thought it wasn't about works. I thought it was about grace. It is about grace, but there is a process in which salvation is an ongoing experience, meaning that it's a better way to say it is sanctification is an ongoing experience whereby we are set apart to be holy. It's a series of decisions. It's a way of life. So the answer is not legalism where we're doing what we feel we have to do and it's not license where we're doing what uh, we feel we want to do because we just want to do it is we take a license to do it. It's all about liberty. And liberty is when, when what we do is to please the Father. And that's what we want to live in is liberty. So as I close here, what does that look like? In 2 Peter, in the first chapter, starting in the fifth verse and going through the eighth, for this very reason, make every effort to add to your faith goodness and to goodness knowledge and to knowledge self-control and to self-control perseverance and to perseverance godliness and to godliness mutual affection. And by the way, that mutual affection, we talked about community. There it is right there. Mutual affection. And the mutual affection, love. For if you possess these qualities in increasing measure, they will keep you from being ineffective and unproductive in your knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. I don't think there would be a challenge there of saying those words, ineffective and unproductive, unless there are those who say, I'll follow Jesus, but they're ineffective and they're unproductive. And everything I want for you for 2022 in this Target series is that you will embrace what causes you to be very effective and very productive for the kingdom. Now, there's a man by the name of Gudzan Borglum, a sculptor, and he was working on the head of Abraham Lincoln that resides in the Capitol Rotunda. A woman who cleaned his studio every evening watched Borglum's work in progress and soon she saw Lincoln's face begin to emerge from the marble. And she finally asked, how did you know that Lincoln was in that stone? The Bible says that we're to be chiseled into the image of Jesus Christ. We may not be there yet but it's a process of life that as we continue to submit to the work of the Holy Spirit who guides us through life who is the divine paraclete meaning the one called alongside to help is what the Greek word word means God brings forth your true identity so son and daughter remember who you are the work that God is doing inside of you, the work that God will do through you, is you embrace an identity whereby sin is not the dominant factor, flesh is not your moral compass, but instead you're living as a child of the light, citizen of heaven. Rise to your feet. I want to pray for you. Philippians 1, 6 says, being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Jesus Christ. God is all over you. God is all over you. There's nothing impossible to God, including the healing of memories, the lifting of your head, your countenance changes, because God loves you. He's your senior partner. And he's writing a story. And it's good. Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus, I pray for each and every person here. God, recognizing that what we're speaking about is our true identity. And I pray, God, now that you will show people that the old is past. Behold, I do a new thing. 
to God that we can have a fresh sense of remembering the very reason for which we were formed in our mother's womb, the very reason for which we were called forward to live this life now in the year 2022, that God, there's holy purpose that runs through our veins. What I've shared is your word and your word never returns void. Heavenly Father, impact each heart and each mind. Call us to fully identify, not with the old self, but to be the new creation. God, to live for you in a way that pleases you and can have your honor, your blessing upon it.